Good morning and afternoon for those of you that is watching it uh, after the fact. Thank you very much for joining the session. Um, I'm excited to uh, uh, cover a few topics here today with you and specifically talk about uh, this collaboration that, uh, that uh, Meta and Qualcomm uh, were engaged over the last few uh, months. So without uh, further ado, since I only have, I guess, 10, 15 minutes, let me jump straight in and see how my pointer is going to work. And it doesn't. And it does. All right. So the theme of the presentation today is inferencing at the edge. Any guesses why it's important? Just at the That's a good point. But there are a few other reasons that are uh, more important, not to you personally, not to me personally, but probably to the people that are actually going to use your application. So first of all, privacy and security. It is probably important to understand that if you take your data, if you take an image that uh, somebody uh, took, a selfie that somebody took with your mobile phone, and you push it into the cloud, obviously, all bets are off on who can touch it, where it's being used, which country it's being processed, and things like that. So privacy security at the edge is extremely important. Um, performance. I think this goes uh, uh, without saying that, that, again, if you're taking a selfie and you want to see how your picture came out, uh, the delays that it might take for you to take that selfie, send it in a cloud, get it processed somewhere in the server, push it back to your device, and then for you to view it uh, on, a, on your display on the phone, probably something that potentially could be a, 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 a showstopper for your particular application. Again, depending on your app, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, particularly these days. I don't know about you, but I have kids. And these days, they're so spoiled, they require instant gratification. If they take a selfie and they cannot see it right there on their phone on display, and they have to wait a few seconds, like, forget it. That app is dead. They're going to uninstall it faster than I can uh, uh, finish this presentation. Um, obviously, personalization. If you have a device and it knows who you are, what you do, and how you like things, um, personalization is something that we can obviously apply. Um, cost, energy goes without saying, right? So if you are processing images somewhere in the cloud and somewhere in the server, guess whose electricity you're using to do that, right? Yours. If you are an app builder and you have to pay for Amazon cloud servers and things like that. If you push that application to run on a particular device, then it's the end device user who's going to use that and, and, and pay for <laughs> electricity to get that uh, algorithm processed. So. When it comes to Qualcomm, obviously we know them from our hardware. And when we try to deploy algorithms on uh, particular ML-based uh, algorithms and deploy them on a mobile uh, devices, we try to take full advantage of everything, every available transistor in a hardware. Goes without saying, CPUs are already there. And everybody can use CPU. GPUs already there. Everybody can use GPU. Qualcomm has a very dedicated piece of hardware. Uh, we call it Hexagon NPU. Um, it is built with ML processing in mind, and it's highly optimized for it. So we see while customers like to use CPUs and GPUs to move their algorithms to the edge devices, at the end of the day, if you really wanted to get performance, if you really to get power efficiencies, you probably want to look at how to offload your use cases uh, to this dedicated piece of hardware. Now, what have we done jointly over the last few uh, uh, months with uh, friends at Meta? Um, we put together uh, uh, um, an executor delegator for a Hexagon NPU. Um, I know there's a graph with a lot of pictures and diagrams, but I think at the end of the day, we integrated our um, software stack to work jointly with an executor. Uh, you take an executor, you uh, partition the model, you quantize the model, you apply some uh, NPU preprocessing things, and then you take a, a ahead of time compiled program, you push it to the device. The device grabs it, recognizes what it is. If your algorithm 
tells that, for, for example, you partition your algorithm and you want to offload it to other runtime, CPUs, GPUs, it goes and does it. But if it finds a portion of the subgraph that it pushes, that it understands that it was built and accelerated for our NPU, it will load it to the NPU. Now, some of the examples that we have, and I'll cover uh, later on, we'll, tell about, we'll talk about it. And for those of you, how many folks attended earlier sessions with an Executorch team? And they talk about subgraphs and everything else. I feel pity for the folks that have NPU accelerators that cannot execute graphs. And then you have to go through this Mickey Mousing of taking a graph, breaking it into the pieces, executing this here, this there. Oh my god, my NPU doesn't accelerate everything. Let me fall back to the CPU and go through all this Mickey Mousing. For us, you take a model, you push it to the NPU, it has to execute everything there, from the first layer to the last layer. So that's kind of what we put together and organized. Um, we contributed all of the work that we've done to the Git repository. Please go there. Examples are there. Our code is there. I, I put some, uh, some links on where you can get everything that you need to do that. Um, there are examples. We've taken a couple popular models that we think that uh, a lot of developers probably kicking tires with. Uh, mobile nets, Inceptions, uh, EDSR, DeepLab. Okay, I guess I misspelled. That was a test, by the way. Nobody in the audience caught that, uh, that I misspelled this thing. So you guys all failed. Regardless of that, so we've taken a couple popular models, we put it there, tested, validated. Now, I'm not just saying that these models would run. Uh, your models will also run, as long as they're using all of the ops that we tested, validated. And, uh, and this is, again, our first contribution. Uh, we have a very robust plan in place that we're putting together to add additional models, validate, test them, and push them forward. Between now and, as you heard earlier, an official launch of the Executorch next October. Okay? So, what does it all mean to you? Um, what it means to you is you can go to the GitHub, you can grab this repository, and I have to admit, I learn from mistakes of others. I'm not gonna do and run a live demo here. So what I did is I captured this video. Feel free to watch as I talk and don't pay attention to me. But this is pretty much a video of one of our developers getting things installed and going through the process of uh, uh, taking a model, running it on, which step are there? Okay, setting up his environment. It is running, right? Okay. Setting up his environment getting things processed, running it initially on a CPU, just to make sure that things work, just to make sure that we get a baseline. Now, as I said, CPUs are everywhere. Everybody can run things on a CPU, but I think it sets a pretty good baseline, and we can take some measurements to see how fast things are. Let me see if we get to that moment. Oh yeah, so we've been highlighting things to show you that yes, we're working, starting an inference, Stopping an inference, and here we go, we see how long it took for an inference. Okay, so now that we've kind of proven ourselves that things are working, things are working on a CPU, let's see how easy it is for this gentleman to go take this model and repurpose it and push it off to run on, oh, they're still kind of going through the, the, the end result. So here we go, we're gonna go and try to say, you know what, now that we've proven ourselves that the model is running on a CPU, let's see how difficult it is to push it to the, uh, a very dedicated accelerator, hexagon NPU. Just a few uh, changes in, in place to, to get that work done. And again, all of this information and all these demos over the last few, over the next few weeks will be posted. So you don't have to, I see somebody's taking notes and, and writing it down, all the commands and everything. Please don't do that, don't bother. We'll put a blog in place, we'll contribute the demo, we, we put everything in place for you guys to, to try to replicate this. Um, and this picture, by the way, for those of you that stopped at the Meta Executor State booth, I think you might have seen them running that on a real phone. Um, and this is actually, by the way, while well, this demo is still running, and we're getting to the end result. Um, this is one of the advantages of this work. So if you're lucky enough to have a mobile phone, uh, hopefully premium mobile phone, a year or two old, you should be able to do this and duplicate it on your phone uh, without a lot of trouble. So what do we see as a result? Really? Okay, so what do we see 
Again, in the interest of time, I'll try to go faster. When I take this model and when I get it to run, um, by the way, if you're running it in real life, it's really, really obvious. You go uh, pick a CPU, you go say run an inference, and then you can count how long it takes for the image to, to, to materialize. So what that tells you is that if you're running MobileNet v2 uh, or a deep lab, frame per second, it takes a few seconds for you to get to an answer, which is awesome because it's there, right? CPUs are always there, but nobody's gonna wait this long, right? And we're not even talking about llamas, we're not talking about anything fancy, right? This is kind of bread and butter things that we talk about. So if we take these exact models and we push them to the NPU through the steps that I just demonstrated. So here are some of the results that we get. So SM8475 is about two year old device, premium phone. So if you guys have like a 2022 uh, Circa phone, like a Galaxy 22, right? That's the kind of device you, you have. If you, the SM8550, if you have a Galaxy 23 and something of that year, that's the kind of device we're talking about here. Again, I'm not talking about timing, I'm talking about frames per second. Uh, you jump from barely, what is it? Two seconds to take you to process one image for the mobile net v2 to something that can do uh, 1500 frames per second. Uh, huge difference, which means that in the same amount of time you can do a lot more things. Uh, there are some magic numbers there, like for example, if you look in the Deep Lab V3, uh, it's 92 frames per second. What does that mean? If you're using it in your application, if you're building uh, something that you want to analyze games or per, on a per frame basis, or you're doing video conferencing, as long as you go past 30 or 60, now suddenly a whole world of possibilities opens up because instead of taking a picture like in the examples that I showed and then maybe somebody takes a selfie and yes it takes a couple seconds for you to improve it and put it on the screen. Now suddenly you're talking about live video conference, live inferencing and not only you can do live inferencing, once you take a frame of the sensor, you apply your model, you're going to do a whole bunch of other things before the next frame shows up and that suddenly opens up a lot of possibilities to the end developers like you and frees up CPU to do better things and definitely frees up GPU to do some additional things that you might wanna uh, add to your up end applications. So with that, I'll finish the session on a very sweet note since my marketing folks were helping me to put together these slides together. They insisted on me putting together our software stack slide and, and yes, uh, PyTorch with an Executorch is one of many options that we offer to our customers. Uh, love to continue working with uh, MetaTeam. And if you folks in the audience have any questions or have any uh, interest in additional models, when a particular model will show up, what kind of features you guys have, when and how it might work on other devices, please feel free to ask. And uh, if I don't have time right now, I'll be more than happy to meet with you outside uh, this conference room and, uh, and answer your questions. So with that, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, so you spoke about uh, executing the entire graph on the NPU with no fallbacks. Yep. So what happens when a new operator gets introduced in one of the so there are a number of ways it could be handled. Uh, our software stack supports a premise of uh, uh, custom operators or user-defined operators or call it whichever way you want it to call it. But we have a set of features in place where you as a developer can just take CC++ code, compile it, create your own custom app and push it on our NPU. The bigger question is how do you take that custom operator that you just created and integrate it into uh, the upper framework so the, the executor recognizes, you, recognizes that. And that's something we're working with the folks here to, to do. Again, from the runtime perspective, we enable that. We support that. The bigger question is how that becomes successful and, and again, there are a number of different ways we can, we can help with that.
So that is up to the execute torch itself. The, the diagram that I showed you does that ahead of time. So you compile that model. So it's not like when you're running it, it's suddenly new to you. Because for you to compile it, it had to be recognized by a compiler and pulled from the library and integrated. But we do. Yep. But we do support, again, there's some ways we have things where we do uh, just in time uh, model preparation and offline model preparation. Again, the way we integrated it with uh, Executorch in a, is a certain fashion and certain ways. And if you feel that there is some better ways to do it, please feel free to let us know. And between Qualcomm and Meta, we can, we can see what we can do to support it. Okay? Do you have another minute? No? Okay, I'll talk to you outside. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.